are alkaline batteries radioactive? We'll find out. But beforehand, here is my hand, and you'll see that it has cat scratches and, of course, a little bit of psoriasis in the knuckles. But it looks really weird in the camera photo, so I just wanted to go up close and personal so you can see that there's nothing actually wrong with my hands, since this gets asked a lot for some unknown reason. Hello, this is Tom from anti-proton.com and back after a little while. So a friend of mine on Twitter, uh, Brandon, told me about something interesting. He's like, oh, there's this thing that's radioactive that's a common household item. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I've tested every common household item. I know about everything that's radioactive. No, there's more. I've had people mention batteries before, but I've always been like, ah, you know, battery, it's not going to be radioactive. What are you talking about? Well, uh, I decided, you know, heck, you know, I'll test one and find out if it's true. So I took a battery like this guy right here, tossed it in a Geiger counter, nothing, right? Of course not. These things aren't plutonium, right? But then I took it and I did a 10-minute count where I left the Geiger counter for 10 minutes with the battery, 10 minutes without the battery. I took what I got from the battery and subtracted it from what I got without the battery, and whatever the difference was was the change, right? It was pretty substantive. It was enough to make me think, hey, maybe there's something to this. So I put it up against scintillation counters like this guy right here, and it didn't get much. So then I decided to put it up against a gamma spectrometer. Now, gamma spectrometer works like this. If there's any gamma radiation coming out of this battery, that gamma radiation, gamma radiation is going to hit a crystal that's inside of the um, scintillation tube. That crystal is going to flash light. Every single gamma ray that strikes the crystal flashes a little pulse of light that is amplified down this tube, it's called a photomultiplier tube, and produces a voltage or a current, a pulse of current out the back. The strength of that pulse, the voltage of that pulse, is proportionate to the energy of the gamma that came out of that battery. And so what that means is that a high energy gamma ray produces a high energy pulse. A low energy gamma ray produces a low energy pulse. Why is that important? Because it produces a, a, a X by Y graph of high and low energies that produces something like a fingerprint that would allow me to see if this is radioactive, but more than that, see what is in it that makes it radioactive, right? Because that's kind of important, too. I want to be able to identify this thing. And so that's how the gamma spectrometer works. Now, this is a scintillation counter. It's about 50% of a gamma spectrometer, but it's missing the other part. So here's what I actually use to do the test. So here is the spectrometer. So I have um, this lead here, and this is to block background radiation. The same as this lead right here, and this is also lead to block background radiation. Because there are many sources of radiation that exist in the world besides what I'm actually testing. For example, this banana is producing uh, um, about one and a half gamma rays per second because it has potassium in it, and potassium has some natural radioactivity. There's three isotopes of potassium that you find in nature. One of them, potassium-40, happens to be radioactive, emits beta radiation, emits gamma rays, all kinds of stuff, but they're still really good for you. You should always eat a banana. That's why I have fruit flies. You will see a fruit fly fly by in this video. I guarantee you'll see one go by because there's fruit flies everywhere because I get an, an infestation of fruit flies like once a month because I'm like terrible about throwing out the bananas after I eat them. I, I throw them in the trash can, but I don't get rid of the trash can fast enough. You have to get rid of it like every day. And the fruit flies are always all over the place. So if you see one go by, what can I tell you? Anyhow, um, so here's the detector. Let's move the lead out of the way. This is what I tested. Oops, well, it's okay. I've already done the test. It doesn't matter that they fell. I tested a whole bunch of batteries. In fact, two, four, six, seven batteries is how many I tested. I want to see if they're radioactive. I didn't test these little ones. I just have these here for show. Now to pull this out and show you what it looks like. Oops, there's my Amazon wire. Why do I have an Amazon wire? Um, I don't know. I, I just do. So anyway, uh, hey, they found a, a Viking warrior woman just recently. Did you hear about that? So um, this is in honor of her. Anyhow, um, this right here is a, a scintillator. This scintillator and this scintillator are really the same thing. They even look the same. Right? This one has one cord, that has two, because this one has it separated, the power going in and the, and the current signal going out, because that's more scientific than this guy. This, the, this one right here, the Ludlum one that's kind of a tan, beige, whatever color, is also a slightly smaller crystal. Now, what we're using inside of this is a sodium iodide crystal that's doped with thallium, and that does the little flashing thing, the scintillation, if you will. And um, that's what we're going to be using to look for this. So what I do is here, here is I run a two-hour background, two hours of testing the background. Then I run two hours with the batteries. And then I subtract the two and see what the difference is. I mean, it's kind of really that simple. And so I've already pr uh, uh, performed this test. And I now know what is in the batteries. And I can tell you for sure 
they're slightly radioactive. Now when I say slightly, they're not dangerous. There's nothing dangerous about these things. They're perfectly normal. And it's not this brand, it's all alkaline batteries. So let me show you what I found. So we took a two hour background without the actual source. We have 7,200 seconds, that's two hours. And we end up with this X by Y graph. So the, the, the um, Y part here, these are the number of counts. So this right here is 1,024 channels. And each little channel got 0, 73, 147 counts, 200, all the way up to 589 counts up here at the top. Now this scrolls, so if you want you can scroll up. See the numbers here are changing? Because this thing will go all the way up to 16 million. But anyway, let's go back to scale here. And the, the, the uh, X part here is the, the energy of the gamma rays detected. So these are in kilo electron volts. So let's click right here in the middle. All right, so in this particular channel right here, this little channel right here, this is channel number 512, and it got 16 gamma rays, and their energy was approximately 1,098 kilo electron volts. So that's just to give you an idea of what that means. So the next couple channels up here, this is channel number 550, and the energy is a little higher. Now it's 1,198, and it got 19 counts. So it deposits in these little 1,024 channels um, account for each gamma ray it detects. So what's this big thing right here? So let's get rid of this ROI, clear that ROI. So let's look at this section right here. So smooth. This is the background coming from the lead. So that lead I showed you that cuts down in the background, well it cuts down a lot of this background, but it causes a spike right here. And the reason is high energy, high energy particles from space are actually hitting the lead and causing it to fluoresce. Just like when your, your, your um, uh, clothing glows back at you when it's hit by a black light or at the club or something, well that's a kind of a lower energy fluorescence, but a higher energy fluorescence, X-ray fluorescence is occurring right here. The, the lead is actually fluorescing. It's, if you like, glowing under the energy of higher, uh, higher energy particles. So that's what that is. Uh, ignore this. This is part of my calibration. This is where cesium-137 is used to calibrate. So <clears throat> you see there's not really that much going on right here. But this right here is what's important. This is potassium-40. So I told you that all potassium that's naturally occurring has three isotopes. Now an isotope has the same number of protons. If you change the proton, you change the element from potassium to, you know, calcium or sodium or whatever your element is, iron, lead, uranium, whatever the element is. The proton number is what changes that. But a particular um, type of potassium that has a particular number of protons, for example, can have a large variety of different counts of neutrons. You can increase and decrease the neutrons without changing what the element is. And these different versions are called isotopes, so they're equal topes. <laughs> so <clears throat> a potassium 39, 40, and 41. Those are all found naturally in nature, like that banana I showed you. So this right here is coming from potassium-40, a radioactive version that's in all potassium. It's in your body, it's in potassium, it's in uh, bananas, it's in everything with potassium. Even when you drink beer, it's in there. Sorry, friends. So anyway, I got in this area, this whole area, I got a total of 971 counts. And this thing basically calculates where this line would have gone if it didn't have a peak and then tells me what the difference is. That's this top part right here. And it says that I have 437 net counts. So that's my two-hour background. So let's look now at the source. This is two hours with the batteries. Seven batteries, and this is that same area, but notice that that's bigger. Now you can use math to see whether or not there's a statistical increase and all this stuff, but we don't need math for this because you can actually see it, like with your own eye. Now you need math for scientific reasons if you wanted to quantify this scientifically. But just between you and I, you can see that that's bigger. Let's flip back and forth quickly. Background batteries. Background, batteries. You see the difference? Now you're like, what? wait a minute, what about that right there? See? Background doesn't have that. Batteries do. Why? That's called a Compton edge. So gamma rays that strike the crystal and, and, and reflect off may get picked up at a lower energy. So basically the gamma ray strikes the crystal and it reflects and only deposits some of its energy and you end up with this Compton, uh, a Compton edge, a Compton plateau, and you can't see it, but there'd be a, something called a Compton backscatter peak, and you, you can't see it because it's not really showing up. But um, all these little Compton artifacts that are a result of uh, the detections. So that's, uh, that's kind of an obvious uh, score. 437, 1145. So we definitely got gamma radiation from the battery, and as you can see also by looking at what's here, a lot of this gets cut down because the batteries are actually blocking the lead fluorescence. 
thus if we if we already didn't know that this is um, coming from the lead we could prove that by noticing that when we put the batteries in between it gets cut down by a lot so anyway um, what it boils down to is the batteries are slightly radioactive now then let's see what happens if we remove the background from the source so this is everything that's left over after the backgrounds removed from the source this right here is additional garbage if you will that came from fluorescence and x-rays and all kinds of random stuff from the from the fact that we had the potassium the potassium striking the lead and striking the metal and causing uh, lower energy x-rays to appear all over the place as well as just some garbage but that right there is what's important and I have all of these to scale so let's go over here that's what it looks like with the background still there when we remove the background you see there's this much all that is potassium so it's smooth smooth oh we're already smooth that's as smooth as it gets see potassium potassium 40 right there who would have thought so it turns out that batteries are slightly radioactive they contain potassium 40 now I wouldn't worry about them they're not gonna hurt you um, there's this, this isn't enough to hurt you remember bananas are radioactive your own body has much more radiation than this and it's coming from potassium 40 so nothing to worry about but I didn't realize they could be so readily detected and these are alkaline batteries this is coming from potassium hydroxide within the battery and batteries contain potassium hydroxide because that's the alkaline that's used in part of the reaction remember they're called alkaline batteries alkaline batteries and um, this stuff is of, called, uh, of course called um, caustic potash otherwise known as uh, potassium hydroxide remember potash potassium potassium you see where the word comes from okay that's why you'll see in other languages it's called that of course in German it's called callium but you know whatever oh look I have updates thank you Windows for appearing just in time when I didn't want you so that's been Tom from anti-proton.com um, I'm going to be putting up more videos finally I'm finally done with my next novel so um, thank you again Brandon for putting this up and for telling me about it and I'm glad I didn't ignore what you said and think to myself I know what I'm talking about there's nothing radioactive in regular batteries because if I had not um, looked it up I would have been very very wrong so thank you for this as well and I'll put your contact information in the video so people can see and follow you on Twitter and uh, follow you on YouTube and see your stuff. So this has been Tom from anti-proton.com. Sorry it's been so long. Oh, one last thing. I'm not reading the comment section because YouTube comments have become toxic. Like it's gotten so bad now in YouTube comments. I just don't even look at them anymore. It's like just people asking me the craziest stuff and, and throwing conspiracy theories and, you know, all the usual threats and stuff. We're not getting into that. So none of that, none of that, none of that. So I'm sorry, but there you go. Bye-bye.